The process of DNA replication is a lot like playing with Lego blocks. If you're trying to build a specific structure, the pieces have to be carefully added in just the right order. In this metaphor, your hands are like enzymes, carefully arranging and joining the Lego blocks, representing the nucleotides, in a specific order. This is the only way you can start with a pile of blocks and end with a functioning toy. DNA replication is a convoluted process, with many moving parts and pieces that need to be combined in a specific order. Yet somehow, this process happens in your body every day, with almost no errors. Several proteins, RNA primers, and other molecules work together to unwind a DNA molecule and replicate it exactly in a semi-conservative way. This information will definitely be on the AP test, so stick with us as we cover everything you need to know about DNA replication. In this video, we'll take a look at section 6.2 of the AP Biology curriculum. We'll start by looking at the different theories of DNA replication that have been proposed and how scientists settled on the theory of semi-conservative replication. Then, we'll see how the process of DNA replication starts with the unwinding of a DNA strand and the enzymes that are necessary to complete this action. After the quiz, we'll get to DNA polymerase and see how it uses free nucleotides to synthesize a new strand of DNA. Finally, we'll see how DNA replication is finished up with a few key enzymes. If you only need to review one of these sections, feel free to skip forward to the times outlined here. Otherwise, let's get started. Once the structure of DNA was fully understood, the process of DNA replication still had to be determined. Several theories were presented as to how DNA was replicated and passed into daughter cells after mitosis or binary fission. The first theory, conservative replication, would happen if both strands of the template DNA molecule stayed bonded and intact while serving as a template for a brand new and identical double-stranded DNA molecule. The second theory, semi-conservative replication, postulates that the two original strands of DNA separate and each of them serves as a template for a new strand, creating DNA molecules that have one original strand and one new strand. The third theory, dispersive replication, considered that in order for strands to not become twisted during replication, the original strand would need to be cut every 10 nucleosides or so. This would create replicated molecules with segments of new double-stranded DNA and segments of the original double-stranded DNA. In order to determine which of these theories was correct, a fantastic experiment was devised. The Messelson-Stahl experiment started with the observation that E. coli bacteria use the elements in their environment to construct new nucleotides and build new DNA molecules. Thus, if you place these bacteria in a solution with normal nitrogen-14, the DNA will be slightly less dense than if you place the bacteria in a solution with the isotope nitrogen-15. You can literally measure the difference in their densities by centrifuging the two types of DNA at high speeds. The DNA with nitrogen-14 will appear higher in the centrifuge test tube than the DNA with nitrogen-15. So, the researchers started by growing E. coli in a solution with heavy nitrogen until all of the DNA in this colony was made from nitrogen-15. Then, this colony of bacteria was transferred to the growing medium that contained only nitrogen-14. This is what they found when they centrifuged and measured the DNA collected from every generation. The original generation showed a single band at the nitrogen-15 level. However, the first generation of bacteria showed a single band at an intermediate density between nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 levels. Since conservative replication would have produced two distinct strands, half of the DNA would have been heavy, while the new half would have been entirely light, this first generation eliminated the conservative hypothesis. But to determine which of the other two hypotheses were correct, researchers had to continue the experiment. When researchers allowed the bacteria to re reproduce a second time, they found two distinct bands, one entirely light and the other intermediate. Continuing for several more generations, 
the percentage of intermediate DNA slowly decreased until only nitrogen-14 DNA was left. Since the second generation had an entirely lightweight band of DNA, dispersive replication was also ruled out. Dispersive replication would have only ever produced one band that slowly became closer and closer to lightweight over time. Therefore, Messelson and Stahl were able to show conclusively that DNA replication is a semi-conservative process. Keep this in mind, everything we are talking about in this video happens in milliseconds. DNA polymerase can add new nucleotides at the rate of 50 per second. Given that a cell uses dozens or even hundreds of DNA polymerase molecules at once, it only takes about 8 hours for a human cell to replicate all 23 chromosomes, incorporating around 6.4 billion free nucleotides into the new strands. Thanks to Messelson and Stahl, we now know that a semi-conservative process takes place that replicates the DNA. But, in order for this process to take place, the DNA strands must first unwind. It took researchers several more decades to figure out how this process worked, since microscopes only go so far, and there are a few obvious hurdles to overcome in semi-conservative replication. First, the two DNA strands must be separated. This is the first problem. But if you simply grab the two strands and pull them apart, the twists that are naturally present in the two strands will be pushed into the remaining double-stranded section, creating a supercoiled DNA that knots up on itself. Supercoiling is similar to what happens when you're trying to get the knots out of your headphones. If you simply grab the two headphones and pull on them, you end up creating tight knots that are even harder to untangle. To overcome these two hurdles, the process of DNA replication uses two very important enzymes, helicase and topoisomerase. Each of these enzymes is absolutely necessary for the processes of DNA replication and RNA transcription. Helicase is an ATP-powered enzyme that pushes apart the two strands of DNA. As helicase encounters a DNA molecule, Regions of the helicase enzyme interact with individual nucleotide bases, destabilizing the hydrogen bonds present. As ATP is supplied to the helicase molecule, it pulls on each of the separated strands, separating the base pairs as it travels along. This allows DNA polymerase to access each strand and start the replication process. Keep in mind that there are many different types of helicase enzymes that act slightly differently in different organisms and situations. However, the cell still needs to deal with the problem of supercoiling. For this, the enzyme topoisomerase is used. You can remember this because topo is in reference to DNA topology, which is the tertiary 3D shape of the DNA, much like a topographic map. Topoisomerase has this name because its job is to change the 3D shape of DNA. Specifically, topoisomerase will relieve the torsion that has been created as helicase separates the strands of DNA. To do this, topoisomerase will cut the sugar phosphate backbone. The torsion will unwind from the DNA strand, giving it back its normal twist and preventing any supercoiling or knotting that would otherwise occur. Then, Topoisomerase reconnects both strands to their original position. Topoisomerase will continue moving ahead of the helicase enzyme as the DNA is replicated to continually relieve the torsion as it builds. Now that we've covered semi-conservative replication and how the unwinding process takes place, let's see if you retained the important points. Pause the video now and take this short quiz. You can find all of the answers to the questions in this video through the quick test prep link in this video's description. After the strands of DNA have been opened up, DNA polymerase can come in and get to work. But DNA polymerase cannot just latch on anywhere and start the process of replication. It needs a little help to get started. First, a protein called primase comes in and adds an RNA primer to the exposed template strand. This gives DNA polymerase an exposed 3' hydroxyl group that it can begin adding new nucleotides to. 
Using free nucleotides from the cytosol, DNA polymerase ensures base pairing occurs between the free nucleotide and the existing template. Then, it catalyzes the formation of the phosphodiester bonds between these nucleotides. The DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides in the 5' to 3' direction. In other words, the DNA polymerase can only catalyze the bond between the 3' hydroxyl group and the phosphate group attached to the 5' carbon of the new nucleotide. This creates a difference between the two different strands of DNA being replicated that is important to understand. Since the two strands of DNA run anti-parallel, the two DNA polymerase molecules operate in different directions. The leading strand is created in the same direction that helicase is opening up the DNA, while the lagging strand is created in the opposite direction. While the DNA polymerase on the leading strand can add nucleotides continuously as helicase opens up new portions of the strand, the DNA polymerase on the lagging strand must continuously reattach to the newly opened template strand. This creates a large number of Okazaki fragments instead of a single new strand. In the next slide, we'll see how these fragments are connected. This is complicated stuff, and sometimes you just need a quick break to refresh. Now's a good time to stretch your legs and get some fresh air. When we come back, we'll finish up the process of DNA replication. Now we're getting to the final steps in replication. You may have noticed that for DNA polymerase to attach to the DNA template, it needed an RNA primer to latch onto. These primers must be removed and filled in with DNA nucleotides for the process of DNA replication to be complete. To do this, another enzyme, called RNAs, is needed to first break down the DNA primers. This leaves a small gap in the DNA strand that must be filled in. The final enzyme that carries out the process of filling in all of the gaps where RNA primers sat and fully connecting the newly synthesized DNA strand is ligase. Free floating nucleotides in the cytosol fill in the gap by base pairing with the nucleotides on the template strand. Ligase works by using ATP to create the phosphodiester bonds that are needed to fully complete the sugar phosphate backbone. This leaves the new DNA molecule fully intact and fully completed. Keep in mind that the lagging strand will require the services of ligase much more than the leading strand, since each Okazaki fragment begins with an RNA primer. Each of these primers must be replaced, filled, and the backbone fully ligated by ligase. Also keep in mind that DNA ligase enzymes work in other situations as well such as when scientists add foreign DNA to a plasmid to create recombinant DNA and fully bond the new pieces in place. You should also remember that many of the enzymes discussed in RNA replication are also used in RNA transcription. Now that we have covered the functions of DNA polymerase and ligase in the process of DNA replication, let's put it all together. Pause the video now and answer the following questions. You can find answers to all the questions in this video through the quick test prep link in this video's description. Be sure to check out the other links to all of the other study resources we have created specifically for this topic. Thanks for watching. Please like this video if you found it helpful and informative. If you still have questions about the process of DNA replication, please leave them for us in the comment section below. Be sure to subscribe to the Biology Dictionary YouTube channel to find all of our AP Biology videos and study resources. Good luck!